Welcome to Wild Olive Studies, a Messianic Gentile study of the Hebrew Scriptures. I'll be your host. My name is David Nitchie, but you can call me Dave. In this session, we'll examine Paul's Foreign Philosophy, Part 1. I want to ask you the question again, who is Rabbi Shaul? And again, we've known him by several names, Paul being the other one. We're going to mainly use Paul's name today because what we're going to be talking about is uh, his life later on. Uh, we will also mention um, Rabbi Shaul as well. So I want to start out by asking you a question like I always do. So my question for you today is, did the Apostle Paul ever make mistakes? What do you think? Of course. What about me? What about you? Do you ever make mistakes? Well, that's really not a problem. You know, mistakes are part of the human condition. And so we're going to look at some of the mistakes that Paul made, and we're going to be a, we're going to introduce that idea today, and we're going to move on into that next time. So if you will follow me, we're going to get into this study right away by asking the question and trying to give an answer of who is Rabbi Shaul. So last time, if you remember, we looked at the three different cultures influencing the Mediterranean at that time, leading up to and during the first century of Paul's day. If one is to begin to understand some of the more difficult passages written by the Apostle, one needs to understand his worldview and cultural context. The same goes for us. If we're going to understand the Apostle Paul, first we need to read him in his Jewish worldview. And secondly, when he is speaking to Gentiles, we need to insert him into his Greco-Roman culture that he is speaking from and to. Today I'll be reading out of the David Stern translation, The Complete Jewish Bible. Just like King David, Paul made some mistakes. David was still considered a man of God after God's own heart, even after his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of uh, Uriah the Hittite. Was King David's parenting skills lacking and his kids dysfunctional? <laughs> Absolutely. Did Kepha or the Apostle Peter make some mistakes? You bet. What we're going to begin to see in today's session is that Paul made some mistakes too, things that he changed later on. The Bible records them and leaves them there as a testimony for all mankind to see. No hiding them, no denying them, no making excuses for them. What I hope you get out of this session is that yes, we are human just like Paul and we will make, also, we will make mistakes as well. But also walking this path with us is the promised Holy Spirit. Paul began his adult ministry as a Pharisee, first in the shadow of Rabbi Gamaliel and then Rabbi Shammai, relying on the letter of the Torah. After his road to Damascus experience, Paul leaves for a time, first to Arabia, then to Damascus, then to Tarsus. Perhaps in his absence, he's beginning to understand that his halakha should be an expression of the divine wisdom of the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit. As Gamaliel taught, and not uh, and not the human reasoning of the letter of the Torah, but please understand me, Paul will not credit this return with his human teachers. His credit will go to the one that left him blind, that removed the scales and allowed him to see. Turn with me first to Ecclesiastes 3.17 to begin our study. Ecclesiastes 3.17 The preacher says, I said to myself, the righteous and the wicked, God will judge, because there is a right time for every intention and for every action. Ecclesiastes 3.17 Our walk is just that, a walk full of missteps, stumbles, blunders, and falls. But just like Paul, we need to repent, stand up, and wipe the dust off, and keep on going. There is far too far to travel, and we have much too much to learn to quit when we fall. Besides being saved doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes. Rather, it means to awaken into a new level of grace and freedom that obedience to the words of God can bring. Obedience brings with it opportunities you'd never dream possible. It opens up the eyes of those born blind. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Remember, Rav Shaul, by his own testimony, says he is Jewish when he shares in Philippians 3.3. 3. If you'll turn there, and we, this is a common passage or a very, uh, 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 very well-used passage in this study. Philippians 3.3. 3. 
He says, For it is we who are circumcised, we who worship the Spirit of God, and make our boast of Messiah Yeshua. And plainly again here in Acts 21, verse 39. If you'll turn there. Acts 21, verse 39. As Shaul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, Is it all right? I say something to you? The commander said, You know Greek? Say, aren't you that Egyptian who tried to start a revolution a while back and led 4,000 armed terrorists out into the desert? Shaul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of an important city, and I ask your permission to let me speak to the people. I want you to take note of something. He calls himself a Jew. This is Acts 21, well after his, his, uh, his meeting with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He calls himself a Jew, but then he says he's not from the tribe of Judah. He is of the tribe of Benjamin. Some say if you're not from Judah, then you're not a Jew. But I want you to see here that Paul calls himself a Benjamite and that he still considers himself a Jew well after his road to Damascus experience with Yeshua. Throughout the rest of this session, you must remember Jew Paul's Jewish roots. It is and will remain his personal identity. But Paul is not sent just to the Jews as some of Yeshua's 12 disciples are. No, he was chosen for a most, most important task. Paul will take the message of a Jewish Messiah to the Gentiles, to non-Jews, who identify with a non-Jewish pagan world. Paul will be challenged with teaching Gentiles the Torah without using Torah language. To do this, he will use the Septuagint, a Greek version of the Older Testament, or the they call it the Tanakh, and when the bridge is made, he will have to teach the Gentiles to know how to walk in a biblical way, a way that does not offend his Jewish brothers, in the, and a way that is pleasing to the Father. Let's see how he manages such an awesome task. First of all, he says he's from Tarsus. In Acts 21.39, again we read, Acts 29.39 says, I'm a citizen of a important city, citizen of an important city. And here you see uh, the map of the area, Cilicia being here, and then of course Tarsus being where the pin is at. Paul draws on his hometown reputation as an important city. Tarsus was a university town and therefore an intellectual hub and seat of the elite. It is under the rule of Caesar Augustus that our knowledge of Tarsus first begins to take shape in the important Strabo, writing about 19 AD, who's a Greek poet. By the way, Yeshua and Paul at this time are about in their 20s, so that'll kind of give you some understanding about where we're at. Uh, um, and I, don't, I, don't, I mean that in the sense that when Strabo was alive, you can see uh, by this slide, he was alive from 63 BCE to 24 CE. So about the time of his death, they're both, uh, both Yeshua and Paul are in their 20s. Um, Strabo says that the enthusiasm of its inhabitants for learning and especially for philosophy. So the people here in Tarsus have an enthusiasm uh, for learning and for philosophy. So that kind of sets the stage. This is an educational town. It's a university town, if you will. Um, in this respect, Strabo also says, Tarsus surpasses Athens and Alexandria and every other university town. It was characterized by the fact that the student body was composed almost entirely of natives, who after finishing their course, usually went abroad to complete their education, and in most cases, did not return home. Tarsus was a sending city. Thus Paul's parents or Shaul's parents follow this code of sending at an early age Shaul leaves. If you remember back several sessions ago in the Perkei Avot 521 which is a section of the Mishnah, formal education for a Jew began at about five years of age and it would begin at the Bet Sefer which is the house of the book. Learning the alphabet, how to read, 
At age 10, they would graduate to the Beit Talmud, the House of Learning. At 12 or 13, their formal education was completed, but if the student desired, and they showed promise, they would be sent to the Beit Midrash, the House of Study, to sit at the feet of the teachers of the law. Acts 22.3, if you'll turn there, Acts 22.3, Again, we've already read this scripture, but it bears reading again. Acts 22, 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. I want to stop and, and say that again. He is identifying with being a Jew that's born in a Roman city. That's very important. Yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as you are all to this day. To sit under the feet of Gamaliel meant that he was, uh, that he was uh, Shaul's rabbi. To sit under rabbi's feet meant that you were there to learn everything that the rabbi had to teach you. You would eat with the rabbi, you would serve with the rabbi, you would work with the rabbi, you would learn from the rabbi. You would learn how the rabbi slept, how he ate, how he conducted business, how he taught, how he obeyed the mitzvot or the commandments. You were to become like your rabbi. And as we discussed earlier, Shaul's rabbi was considered the beauty of the Torah. Gabaliel was considered one of the best rabbis of his time. And becoming one of his Talmud, or students, meant that you could memorize Torah, recite, and recall large portions, string passages together using rabbinic techniques, and provide the rulings and commentary of the rabbis. For this level of education, learning did not come cheap. Learning from such a notable rabbi came with a hefty price. So, where did the money come from to take care of this hefty price? Let's talk about his parents. Who were Shaul's parents? There is nothing in the New Testament about them. They're a kind of a mystery. However, we gain some information from a man by the name of Jerome. Jerome was the man responsible for translating the Tanakh, or uh, the uh, the uh, Latin version of the New Testament called the Vulgate. Um, uh, I'm sorry, of the Old Testament called the, the Vulgate. In the fourth century, he relates a tradition whereby Shaul says his parents are from Geshala in Galilee, a Jewish town about 25 miles north of Nazareth. According to Jerome, when, he revolt, when the revolts broke out through Galilee following the death of Herod in 4 BC, his parents were rounded up and sent to Tarsus as a part of a massive exile by the Romans to prevent any potential trouble. Jerome also says that Shaul was born in Geshala and would have fled with his parents. While this contradicts Shaul's own story, it does give us some idea when he may have been born. Let's go back to Acts 22. This passage hints that Shaul's family came from a wealthy family. His parents may have fled the persecutions due to the Jewish revolts or his grandparents may have been slaves of the Hellenist invasion under Antiochus Epiphanes. No one really knows for sure. Maybe his family obtained Roman citizenship when Pompey, a Roman general, subjected Tarsus under Roman law, making it the capital of Cilicia in 66 BCE. All of its inhabitants would have received Roman citizenship, making his family and ultimately Shaul of dual citizenry. So where did Paul's parents' money come from? We get a clue that he may have learned a trade from his parents, and this may be what he is doing in Tarsus, aside from studying for the two years that he spends there in Acts 9 through 11. In Acts 18, we read, and because he had the same trade as they, making tents, he stayed on with them and worked together. That's Acts 18.3. So we see that he's staying on and that he's actually working in a trade, and that trade is making tents. A famous quote from the Talmud says, Who hath not worked shall not eat. And that's in um, Genesis Rabbah. This is either a quote from our Apostle Paul, who is quoting the rabbis, or the rabbis are quoting him in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if you want to turn there, the rabbi Shaul, or Paul, says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this command, If someone won't work, he shouldn't eat. Sounds exactly like what we see in Genesis Rabbah. And again in the Talmud, we read, 
He who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to steal. So what we learn is Paul has a work ethic demonstrated in a trade he probably learned from his father. Who would have thought that tent making could be lucrative enough to send Paul to Jerusalem to study under the most prestigious rabbi of that time? With just a little more digging, we find that Mark Anthony and Cleopatra held feasts in Tarsus while they built their fleet of ships in its harbor. Since it was a major port for Rome, legions of slaves and Roman soldiers would have been needed to fulfill the ranks of workers, craftsmen, sailors, and soldiers. Naturally, they would have needed quick, affordable housing, like an eight to 10 man contubernium, uh, uh, which is a tent, which would have fit the bill rather effectively. And here you see one right here. And this one's made out of leather. It also would have been made out of linen. Hundreds, if not thousands of these would have been needed just to house the workers at the port, not to mention the legions necessary to shelter the Roman war machine as it slogged its way through the occupied lands. The solution to Paul's family wealth is purely subjective on my part, but makes sense given the occupation, geographical location, and business opportunity afforded at that time. Paul's parents could have employed many workers or slaves to meet the demand of making and repairing these tents. With that background, it's time to move forward. Let's begin by looking at the foreign philosophy that Paul would have learned as a young man studying under Torah instruction of his Rabbi Gamaliel. We pick up in Athens in Acts 17. So if you'll turn with me to Acts 17. Here we see the peninsula of Greece and the location of Athens. Athens being down here. Keep in mind that this chapter of Paul's life where we read of his journey in philosophy takes place around 54-58 CE Christian era, about 20 years since the resurrection. Okay, this represents Paul's missionary journeys. Now, if you've studied this, you've noticed that there are many versions of this missionary journey. We're going to use this uh, particular uh, list of dates. Um, although I'm not going to be that dogmatic and say this is exactly the time period, the, exactly the dates, I don't feel there's confidence to do that. I feel there's a pretty good um, uh, knowledge about, about around the time period, but again, I'm not going to be dogmatic. And if you have different dates, uh, then, then I would probably uh, agree with those as well. But we're going to use these. So these are the journeys as a Shelyak, or a, an apostle, which means a sent one, according to one author. A call that he likely assumed from his earthly education and his Torah teacher, Gamaliel. Remember, Tarsus was famous for educating and sending out students according to Strabo. And again, I'm not going to go through all of these. And again, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're interested in these dates, then you can copy them down. Um, and again, pause this, and then you can get them. Our story picks up in Athens during the second missionary journey, where our Orthodox rabbi meets the world of idolatry and Western thought. Turn with me to Acts 17 if you've not done so already. Okay, we're in Athens, and that's where uh, we're going we're gonna to find the Apostle Paul. So we pick up in Acts 17, we're going to read verses 15 through 18. Shaul's escort went with him as far as Athens then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to come as quickly as they could. While Shaul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit within him was disturbed at the sight of the city full of idols. And you can imagine this young man from, from Jerusalem who studied under Gamaliel and was warned against idols, how uncomfortable he must really feel. So he began holding discussions in the synagogue with Jews and the God-fearers and in the market square every day with the people who happened to be there. Also, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers started meeting with him. Some asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others, because he proclaimed the good news about Yeshua and the resurrection, said, he sounds like a protagonist, a propagandist for uh, foreign gods. I'd like to also read this out of Young's literal translation, and we get a little slightly different word usage here for the name babbler. Acts 17, 15 through 18, out of Young's literal translation. 
And those conducting Paul brought him into Athens, and having received command unto Silas and Timotheus, that with all speed that they may come unto him, they departed, and Paul waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, beholding the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, indeed, he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace every day with those who met with him. And certain of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers were meeting together to see him, and some were saying, What would this seed picker wish to say? And others, of foreign gods. He doth seem to be an announcer, because he spoke of Jesus and the resurrection, proclaiming to them as good news. First, I would like to define the term babbler or seed picker before we talk about our first two philosophies. The term babbler comes from the Greek word spermologus or seed picker, usually refers to a bird like a crow or a seagull, a freeloader or scavenger who hangs around the open markets to live off of scraps. This was not a compliment. The Apostle Paul, who was born the son of a Pharisee to wealthy parents and studied under the principal rabbi of his time, is called a free-loading, scavenging bird. In his attempt to dialogue with the Greek philosophers, he has mixed Greek philosophy with the message of the gospel. Borrowing from his teacher, again, Gamaliel would have taught him some Greek philosophy, he patches together Greek secular philosophy with the truth to try to introduce Jewish monotheism and the gospel in terms familiar to these Athenian intellectuals in accordance with his personal testimony. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.22, just look up here, you don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 9.22, we read, I have become all things to all men. The result of this attempt is that these philosophy students laugh at him. The reference to a seed picker cuts deep. They use the term to denigrate Paul's pharisaic rhetorical skills. They are ridiculing his attempt to sound like a philosopher. To them, he had picked up a few scraps of Greek philosophy, but according to them, he didn't know what he was talking about. The brilliant Apostle Paul is in the midst of a spiritual battle, pitted against the best minds of Greek philosophy. Paul's Athenian attempt to reveal the personal nature of God of Israel and convince the Greeks of the resurrection and the hope of the world to come falls on deaf ears. But why? It would be nice to know who he is up against. Who is his audience in Athens? Let's go back to Acts 17, 18, and we'll read Acts 17 and 18. And certain of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers were meeting together to see him. First, let's look at the group he had encountered, the Stoics. The Stoics began around 300 BCE by a man by the name of Zeno. This Greek school of philosophy was founded in Athens by Zeno of Citium, seen here on the left who lived from 333 to 262 BCE. The school got its name from the painted porch, or Stoa Pokili, in Athens where Zeno studied. Walking up and down the open hallways, he lectured to his students on the value of apatheia, where we get apathy, the absence of passion, something not too different from the Buddhist idea of non-attachment. By passion, Zeno meant uncontrolled emotion or physical desire. Only by taking this attitude, he felt, could we develop wisdom and ability to apply it. Some of Zeno's sayings were, let no one break your will. Man conquers the world by conquering himself. Start by developing an indifference to pain and pleasure through meditation. Wisdom occurs when reason controls passions. And evil occurs when passion controls us. Stoicism was very popular among the Romans, who generally liked moderate behavior anyway. The two most famous Roman Stoics were Cicero and Seneca. Let's now look at the Epicureans. Epicurus was the founder of Epicureanism. We see him on the right. Epicureanism also started around 300 BCE, and the Epicureans followed the teaching of the man who founded the ideas and who it was named after. Here, you see him on the right, as we've said. Epicurus lived from about 341 to 270 BCE. Epicurus had little patience with religion, which he considered a form of ignorance. He taught that reality can only be perceived through the five senses and was particularly eager to help people lose their fear of the gods. He did, however, also say that the gods existed, although they lived far away in space, somewhere and had little or nothing to do with the people on earth. 
Epicurus felt that it was useless to argue over metaphysics. Now, what's metaphysics, you ask? Metaphysics, the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things, including abstract concepts such as being knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, and space. He believed that there was no such thing as a soul that lived after death, that we arrived at our present condition by means of evolution, and that we had the that uh, we had the quality of free will. The Epicureans prescribed to a moderate form of hedonism. So what is hedonism, you ask? Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure or sensual self-indulgence. The Epicureans said that the best way to be happy and not sad was to not want anything. They taught that pleasure in the absence of pain was life's greatest good. They discouraged vice, overindulgence, and sensual pleasures, not because they were wrong, but that they could lead to later suffering. Because Epicurus dismissed the supernatural divine revelation and divine intervention, a pronouncement about them appears in the Mishnah. So the Mishnah has something about Epicureanism. In the Mishnah we read, and these are the ones who do not have a portion in the world to come. He who maintains that the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is not derived from the Torah. He who maintains that the Torah was not divinely revealed and the Epicurean. Sorry. <clears throat> Thus the Mishnah states that the Epicureans have no place in the world to come. It seems that Paul's boldness and zeal first led him to the Hellenist Jews living in the diaspora or exile lands during his missionary journeys. But the message of a Jewish Messiah Jewish monotheism, the resurrection of the dead, and the world to come would soon make its way into the halls of Greek philosophy with little success. These intellectual Greeks were another matter. As brilliant as Paul was, and again, the Apostle Paul is who we're talking about who wrote most of the New Testament, it seemed that no amount of reasoning could convince them otherwise. His parents' wealth brought him to the best education, and his zeal brought him to what we thought he thought was fertile ground. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, also bearing witness that he was where he was supposed to be. No matter how exciting the mission seemed, the battle was real. But why go to these Gentiles? What drove him to this effort? Perhaps our answer is in the Hebrew Scriptures. In, six, in Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 2, we read, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out brightly and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. Well, our time is up and we still have so much more to cover. Be with us next time when we look at the second part of Paul's foreign philosophy and discover that certain popular sayings of the Apostle Paul may not have been divinely inspired at all, but were rescued from another source. So until next time, Shalom.